Jodie Beck is Policy and Campaigns Officer at Liberty, and we're going to be speaking about the Public Order Act, the newest, latest uh, anti-democratic, anti-protest legislation that the government has passed. The context in which we're talking about this in is um, at the coronation that took place last weekend, the, the policing of protests was thrown into the spotlight as a result of a series of arrests that were made at those um, at at the time of the coronation, some of it seemingly completely unrelated to the coronation. Um, what's your understanding of what happened last weekend? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I think I think the starting point for this is if we go back to the week before the coronation, so the run up to it, um, there was kind of a toxic cocktail of lots of different measures and, and pieces of legislation that were passed with the intention of those powers being used for the coronation. So we had the Public Order Act gaining royal assent on the Tuesday before and coming into force the day after, which I'm sure we'll get on to about, you know, the implications of that. We had a statutory instrument rushed through um, and immediately made into force by the Home Secretary, which... Um, for context of statutory instrument you don't have to it doesn't go through the same stage as a, a, a big piece of legislation would so that was kind of you know a diktat by the home secretary and what that did was lower the threshold of serious disruption from significant to more than minor so the police could impose restrictions on protest if they were felt to um possibly be more than minor or, or, or kind of disrupt to a more than minor degree, whatever that actually means, that's a whole other question. Um, and then the third significant thing was that facial recognition technology was also kind of announced to be rolled out through Westminster. So you had a toxic combination of really repressive and restrictive measures and pieces of legislation that were passed in on the run, run up to the coronation. And so obviously what happened during the coronation is, is, as you say, we saw a range of arrests, both of protesters, people that were going to protest, um, people who were protesting, but also people who were just going about their, you know, daily activities. You know, we saw six members of Republic arrested with a statement from the Met on the, the Monday night afterwards, stating that they believed items found alongside a number of placards could be used as lock-on devices. We saw journalists arrested, you know, Rich Felgate, who um, was a filmmaker, he was arrested while he was filming a Just Up Oil supporter holding a banner on the pavement near the coronation route, and he was arrested on the basis of conspiracy to commit a public nuisance, which was quite a common thread throughout the weekend. Um, we saw numerous um, folks arrested for wearing Just Up Oil t-shirts. Um, and then I guess branching out of, of kind of protest for a second, we um, I'm sure and I'm sure viewers have, have seen this already, but, you know, members of the Westminster night safety team were arrested and, you know, they're a voluntary group that have been working in the borough for many, many years. Um, doing things like handing out rape alarms to reduce violence against women and girls. Um, and they were arrested and held for many, many hours. Um, and then we had, you know, the case of Alice Chambers who wanted, who was going along to watch the coronation and she was arrested because she was nearby some Just Up Oil protesters and then held for 13 hours. Um, so, you know, it was a real broad, I guess the result of what was a zero tolerance approach being taken by the Met, but also, you know, that, that I guess, in my mind was a top-down instruction from the government itself um given the powers that were kind of pushed through just days before the coronation so obviously we talked a little bit and you mentioned it there about the the public order act being introduced just before the coronation now this is something that's been talked about a little bit in relation to the protests in the wider media conversation but i wonder if you could sort of set out what the Public Order Act is and what it means for the right to protest. Yeah, sure. So, you know, as I just said, the the, the proximity between the Royal Assent of the Public Order Act and the coronation is really interesting because, you know, even if our starting point is believing that we do need more Public Order Act powers, and I'm sure actually that's not your position or anyone viewing this as position, it's certainly not mine, but that it kind of begs the question, if, if Royal Assent of the Public Order Act happened on Tuesday and the powers came into force on Wednesday, 
how would the police even know how to use those powers? Like how, how, what's their understanding of the powers? You know, it, it's, it's 24 hours. And usually just to kind of put that in context, um, usually commencement of a piece of legislation is two months, at least two months after Royal Assent. So, you know, that, you know, indicates that there's some amount of time to operationalize whatever the piece of legislation says. But more generally, the Public Order Act is, you know, the government's latest uh, attack on protest. Um, it, it, come, it was um, kind of laid before Parliament under a year. No, sorry, just a few months after the Policing Act passed, which was, you know, another piece of anti-protest legislation that I'm sure we'll talk about a little later. Um, but the Public Order Act contains, you know, a wide range of new protest related offences, whether that's locking on or be going equipped to lock on, um, which we saw used during the coronation to, to kind of criminalise the Republic protesters. It contains things like a tunnelling offence, you know, kind of speaking to the tactics used by some particular groups. But it also expands existing police powers like stop and search to a protest specific context um, and also includes um, something called serious disruption prevention orders, which is essentially ASBOs for protesters, um, which can see named individuals banned from going to protest. So it's, it's a deeply concerning and repressive piece of legislation. Um, and, you know, arrest the arrest over the coronation weekend showed what what you know liberty and others have been saying for months and months and months in our campaigning against the bill that the powers in the public order act are so broad and therefore miss the misuse of those powers as we saw over the coronation weekend is is, is actually not not surprising if we look at actually what the legislation says so taking the locking on example Liberty and others warned that, you know, the offence of going equipped to lock on um, could be used to stop protests before they even start. And that's what we saw with Republic because they were, um, they found luggage, the police found luggage straps amongst their placards and believed that that was a locking on device. And when it was first introduced, um, a member of the House of Lords, Lord Paddock, who was a big kind of, he was staunchly opposed to this legislation. He offered an example, which I think is quite, illuminating he said you could buy a tube of super glue to repair a broken chair at home then get caught up in a protest and be accused of going equipped to lock on so it's so incredibly broad but I think if we think about how the locking on offense for example links to other things in the bill like stop and search so within the stop and search power there's a list of prohibited objects and actually what a prohibited object is, as defined by this bill, is something that can be used in the course of or in connection with a protest. So it's a whole host of items um, that, you know, could could bring you right under the nose of a police officer who could stop and search you, which we know and we, we, we talk a lot at Liberty about how that, you know, that's a deeply traumatic process being, you know, searched by a police officer. One that is, you know, not often not felt equally if we think about the rates of stop and search and how racialized that is with, you know, young black boys being being um, the group of people that are most often stopped and searched. And, you know, more broadly, I think the Public Order Act is, is just another significant expansion of police powers across the board at a time when trust and confidence in policing is an all time is at an all time low. Um, and the policing of the coronation is is just kind of the latest in Britain's kind of quite shameful history in policing protests. You know, we saw um, around the Queen's death, the Metropolitan Police had to apologise because yet again, they were arresting folks that were just going out to voice their opinions and protest against the monarchy. You know, we, we had folks who were just holding up a blank sheet of paper and were threatened with arrest. And, and then we've seen it, you know, with the policing of the Sarah Everard vigil and the police violence that took place place there. So actually, I think sometimes it, it it's really easy to view all of this as quite surprising. But if we think about, you know, the direction of travel by the police, but also by the government in terms of the, the kind of slew of legislation that they've been passing over recent years, it, it really isn't. Yeah, and I think so. You mentioned there, um, I guess, the, the wider context of, of different legislation on this stuff. And you also mentioned the the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act, which uh, I guess came into force about a year ago now. Um, obviously, that uh, led to a significant sort of 
uh, resistance movement to that piece of legislation. You saw the, the sort of uprising in Bristol and protests elsewhere, the, the kind of kill the bill banner. Um, but, you know, when that legislation came in, it was, you know, deemed to be an incredibly draconian piece of legislation for a number of reasons. And now we've got the Public Order Act coming in as well. How do these two pieces of legislation relate to each other, given that it already seemed like the, the government was giving huge more powers to the police around this stuff prior with the Policing Act? Um, yeah, how do these two, the, the Policing Act and the um, Public Order Act, relate to each other? Yeah, so they have an interesting relationship to say the least. So yeah, you're you're right in saying, you know, the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act, um, it was the government was kind of touted as the government's land landmark policing and crime legislation, you know, um, public order and protest was only one small, seemingly small chunk of that, despite it having huge consequences for our right to protest. You know, it contained other things around, you know, clamping down on um gypsy and traveller rights um, and other things around sentencing, etc. But yeah, the, the PCSC Act, well, Bill, when it was, was first kind of tabled, sparked huge, you know, movement against it, you know, in light of, um, of the murder of Sarah Everard, you know, seeing this huge expansion of police powers, we saw such a huge movement, you know, take to the streets to, to say no, like to voice their opposition. Um, and I think in some ways that's that's why there was a huge campaign against the bill. It was really sparked on the streets by people, you know, coming out in, in, in kind of thousands. Um, in terms of its relationship to the Public Order Act, so, when the so the PCSC Act, it had a bunch of new powers for the police to restrict protests. That the headline power there was enabling the police to restrict protests that were too noisy and to be able to make a judgment on a noise level. Um, and although that's deeply concerning, it's also absurd because how like if you give the power the police to to kind of interpret how they I guess make a judgment on what is too noisy that they're just not going to be able to do that you know there's no consistent way of doing that but also it's just totally wrong given the nature of how central noise is to protest you know it's how we make our voices heard it's how we yeah it's how we stand up to power um so all along there was this real deep understanding um by campaigners working against this bill that you know it, it's a direct clampdown on the movements that are taken to the streets now whether that's you know environmental groups like xr and just up oil or black lives matter who were who um were obviously protesting a lot throughout the summer of 2020 um and it also contained um a lot of powers for the Home Secretary of the day to define what serious disruption means. And that's been a common thread throughout the PCSC Act, but also the Public Order Act now. So when the when the piece of legislation was passing through Parliament, the government decided to add a bunch of new measures to that bill when the bill had already passed through the Commons. So they did that in November 2021. That was when the, the PCSC bill was already in the Lords and parliamentary procedure says that if a piece of legislation is passed through the Commons, anything that is in that is introduced into the bill when it's in the Lords, if it is booted out in the Lords, it can't be added back in again. And so in November 2021, the government literally added everything that is in the Public Order Act now, the one that passed a couple of weeks ago, they tried to add that to the PCSC Act in November 2021. And then in January 2022, the House of Lords resoundingly rejected all of those measures. So it's a real cross party um, opposition to this, you know, and, and I think it's important to say that, you know, it, it was genuinely cross party. But a lot of the opposition especially the conservative opposition was was around the procedural point you know you can't you can't make laws in this way you can't add things in willy-nilly when you feel like it we're booting this out because you should have done this properly um but it was a really interesting coalition of of um i guess peers in the house of lords that um that came together against that i think there was around 14 government defeats in total so it was it was huge um and then the government um 
that bill gained that act be, that bill became the PCSC Act, and then literally two months later we had the public order bill, which was all of the stuff that got booted out back into another bill. And this is a real pattern from this government. You know, it happened. It's happened across many different bills, but especially with protest. I know earlier I spoke about a statutory instrument that came in the week before the coronation. That statutory instrument that lowers the threshold of serious disruption is something that the Lords booted out of the Public Order Act that was gained royal assent. So, you know, this is the the government's way of of just throwing powers in that they know actually doesn't command they, they don't command public support regardless of however the government wants to whip up a narrative around just stop oil or xr disrupting ordinary people's lives like i think across the board like people actually don't buy into that and you know i think something we've tried to do at liberty when we're campaigning on this is like speak about the universality of protest you know you never it especially under a cost of living crisis, which which I think is a really important example. You never know when you might need to take to the streets um, to, to use protest as a tool for making your voices heard. You know, we've spoken to campaigners who, you know, renters' rights campaigners, for example, who work with people that are being evicted to mobilise outside of their, um, their housing association's building to demand change, um, or people that, you know, mobilized with with um, people in their community who've maybe never been on a protest before to save their local library like I think you know trying to speak to how important this is for all of us despite what the what the government is trying to do um so yeah and so I wanted to ask you about sort of what the a better way of governing protests would be and look like. But before I do that, I've got a great question that's come in on the chat um, from somebody who's asking about how we, I guess, make the current situation better on the assumption that, you know, we're going to be stuck with these um, pieces of legislation for the coming few years, at least. So Akira Zilla has asked, um, one of the biggest issues with public order legislation is that the police who enforce it have little understanding of it. Um, and that speaks to what we were talking about earlier, I guess, in terms of the the, the time in which the led, the Public Order Act was passed and then its implementation. So what can and should be done to address that in terms of ensuring that the police actually understand what powers they really do have um, and how they can enforce the legislation that we currently have, notwithstanding that we want to get rid of that legislation and that framework, which we'll talk about next. Yeah, that's a really great question. And it's a tricky one, actually, because I think the immediate thing is to talk about training police officers or offering guidance. But even that feels deeply imperfect as a solution because the powers they actually have are really harmful. And they they sim put it, putting it simply, they just shouldn't have those powers. And so I think repeal is the obvious answer in it, but I think it really needs to be centered in our demands for what needs to happen now. But I think what, what that question has made me think of is, I think over the past couple of weeks when we've seen the environment for protests shrink with this new legislation, it's important not to believe, not to feel that protesting is illegal. It's not. It's just been restricted. The environment is more hostile for protests now, I think it's fair to say. But people should keep protesting. And I think the question is, how do we do that safely? One, one practical thing that comes to mind is, you know, um, getting to grips with what your rights are. Um, in protest now, um, Liberty have just kind of released um, a bunch of resources that break down this legislation and, and really, yeah, kind of offer some practical advice on what this means for whether you're organising a protest or whether you're just attending a protest. Um, and also, I think promoting the work of legal observers is really important. So those are, you know, independent um observers who go along to protest they hand out little bus cards with your rights on them um, and they yeah I guess independently monitor the policing of protests and that kind of the function of legal observation I think is really really important in in it's almost like kind of yeah I guess what what we can build in our movement groups and in our communities to like keep ourselves safe um, but I think you know my mind does just keep going back to the repeal question because, you know, the direction of travel from this government is one that 
you know, it's almost like they see a new tactic, which oftentimes isn't new. It's just more of an urgent tactic because people don't feel like their voice is being heard. Like locking on, we know, has been used throughout history by lots of different groups. It's not a new tactic, um, even though it is being used more frequently recently. What they're doing is they're just they're creating legislation to respond directly to those tactics. And that is the concerning thing. Um, because that doesn't just affect those groups and those groups will continue to move to more urgent routes if the, the tactics that they've previously used have been criminalized. So yeah, repeal, repeal is at the center, but I think, yeah, thinking practically about safety and how we keep protesting and using this route um, is, is really important. So finally then, um, so obviously we've talked about the public order acts, talked about the Police, Crime, Sentencing and Courts Act, but they're just part of a wider trend of legislation we've seen over the last few decades, which has restricted and restricted and restricted the right to protest in the UK, whether it be, you know, anti-trade union legislation, loads of different bits and pieces. Now, you said that you keep going back to the repeal question. So what I wanted to to ask you really is... um, We've had this 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 raft of legislation that has tightened and re- introduced new restrictions on the right to protest. What would be a better model for governing the right to protest in the UK? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I think, you know, I think the... I think it feels important to say that, you know, under a government that continues to pass such repressive legislation, it's really quite hard to think about the more visionary stuff. Like, actually, what is what should this system look like? Because I think we're squeezed into these, you know, this kind of damage control work a lot of the time. Um, But I wanted to just in answering this question, I wanted to promote the work of NetPol. I'd really encourage like kind of viewers to check them out they actually produced a charter for freedom of assembly rights where they really think broadly about, you know, yeah, what 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 are the conditions we need to protest safely and to be able to, to have this, you know, our freedom of assembly kind of protected. And they talk about the need to move beyond the framework of state facilitation of protest. So at the moment, we always talk about, you know, the police have a duty to facilitate protest rather than we need our right to protest protected. We don't just need it facilitated, we need it protected. In line with international guidelines, you know, the United Nations have been banging on about this for so long. Um, So how do we move away from the language of public order, which is so woolly and is used by police to justify a range of restrictions on protest? And then, yeah, moving towards protection, which acknowledges that those expressing a political message should have a heightened level of protection and that, you know, disruption is inherent within protest and, you know, public order and disruption that always going to be kind of coupled together in legislation that will just, you know, fuel the increase of criminal offences, the increase of, you know, misuse of of powers and arrests, etc. However, I think the important thing to say about that, about, you know, when people are expressing a political message, how is that protected? that needs to be situated within a framework of anti-oppression and NetPol in their kind of charter, they talk about how those protections, yeah, they need to be based on equality and non-discrimination. So that means prohibiting discrimination against participants in an assembly or at a protest. Um, So thinking about, you know, um, how accessing protests and taking part in protests looks different for for everybody. Like, what does it mean to be a disabled person and go to protests? Like, what accommodations do you need to make that accessible? And also protecting participants and organisers of protest who were targeted by other groups, by the far right. Um, um, And yeah, what does that look like? Because yeah, and like how do we ba- yeah balance the need for greater protections for protests but also acknowledging that there are people that protest um on demands that are actively harmful to particular groups in society um and i think again kind of i want to go back to repeal just because although it feels like almost like low hanging fruit um i think it's something we really need to keep on all of our agendas, all of our campaigning and political agendas as we approach election season. Um, You know, we've seen parties in the past couple of weeks um, not really commit to repealing this legislation. Um, And I think that's something we need to really keep top of mind 
um, as going hand in hand with the more visionary and building work that we need to do to really create a protective landscape for protest. Katie, thank you so much for giving up a portion of your Sunday evening to chat to me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. No worries. Thanks.